good afternoon, everybody. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I am delighted to welcome all of you here this afternoon on behalf of the Ford School community. We are very honored today to be joined by a man who, for so many people, became the single essential source of information over the past months as the dramatic, transformational, world-changing events happened in the Arab Spring. Um, we, in a few moments, I will be introducing our speaker, Sheikh Sultan al Um But before I do that, I would like to tell you a little bit about the origins of this lecture series, which is something that the school has been very, very proud to host. Um, this, as you know, is the Josh Rosenthal Lecture. Josh Rosenthal was a graduate of the University of Michigan in 1979, and he went on to earn a master's degree in public policy from Princeton University. His deep interest in policy analysis and international affairs led him to work in the field of international finance, and he was in the World Trade Towers on September 11th of 2001, and Josh died in that attack. His mother, Marilyn Rosenthal, was a longtime faculty member here at the University of Michigan, and she was determined to create a positive meaning from what had happened on 9-11. And her intent was to help fulfill her son's early optimism about the world and the role that mutual understanding, dialogue, and analysis play in improving communities both here in the United States and around the world. Marilyn and a number of others worked to establish the Josh Rosenthal Education Fund, which has enabled the Ford School to bring leading public figures to Ann Arbor each September to share their insights to foster dialogue and generate a greater understanding of the many ways in which the world has changed since 9-11 and um, the many ways that we can continue to help to foster and encourage that change. And, um, are there members of the Rosenthal family who were able to join us here today? <coughs> Welcome. It's wonderful to see you. We're delighted that you are able to be here. Um, I know that Josh's sister, Helen Rosenthal, is watching um, on our live, our live feed. And uh, I know that there are many others around the country who are doing so as well. So we welcome her in that venue. Um, I do want to make a very special thank you to the Rosenthal family for their support. We are very grateful to them for um, being able to continue the Josh Rosenthal lecture and this dialogue. Marilyn Rosenthal died in 2007, but I know that she would have been extremely pleased, especially on the 10th anniversary of the events on 9-11, to welcome Sheikh Sultan here this year as our Rosenthal lecturer. Sheikh Sultan is a successful businessman, and he is the founder and chairman of Bargeel Securities, a financial products company and the managing director of Al Saud Company uh, Limited, which specializes in equity markets, real estate, and construction. He's a teacher as well, a non-resident fellow at the Dubai School of Government, and a lecturer at the Dubai Men's College on uh, Middle Eastern history and entrepreneurship. But Sultan is perhaps best known internationally for his commentary, analysis, and dissemination of social, political, and economic news from the Middle East. He's a columnist at the National Newspaper in Abu Dhabi, and he co-hosts a weekly show on Dubai Eye Radio. His columns appear regularly in The National and Money Works, and he's been published internationally in The Financial Times, The Daily Star in Lebanon, The Huffington Post, and others. Over 78,000 follow his commentary on Twitter. And that number exploded this past winter when during the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, his nearly instantaneous translations of Arab language news were seized on by English-speaking journalists and observers hungry to follow and understand the changes that were sweeping the region. We could not be more pleased this afternoon and honored to welcome Sheikh Sultan al Qasemi to Ann Arbor and to the Ford School, and I am delighted now to welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm not tweeting, I'm just checking the time so that I don't <laughs> take any of your time. 
Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm very honored to be here amongst you, um, especially uh, you know due, uh, considering the circumstances. And uh, I am mindful that we are all um, able to be here as a result of a grant um, by the very generous family of Joshua Rosenthal, who uh, passed away, as we heard, um, 10 years ago uh, this month. Um, in fact, um, it's very, uh, it's very fitting, I think, that uh, we are speaking on this, on this occasion because a lot of us have been, have been affected by those horrible, tragic events. We, all, we also heard that a few months ago, um, the person who planned these horrific events was, uh, you know, uh, killed. And um, in fact, I had written a couple of articles about how he had died several times before he was killed. He had died in the streets of Cairo. He had died in the streets of Benghazi. He had died in the streets of Sana'a. He had died in Bahrain. He had died in Tunisia. He had died all over the Arab world, where no one, but a single one of the millions upon millions of Arab and Middle Eastern protesters even had a single decent word to say about that horrific terrorist. So um, the world has uh, come full circle, I think. and. Uh, we're ready to, take, to talk about the future. Now, I'm going to talk to you about uh, four issues. But before I do, let's look at the background of the term Arab Spring. What is the Arab Spring? A lot of people um, dispute this word. It's not popular at all among some circles. It looks, it's looked upon as being an Orientalist word, a word that came from, you know, um, from writers outside the Middle East region. And the origin of the word actually is uh, by a French writer who, who, uh, who didn't have a very good history. He was a Nazi collaborator, so probably try to avoid using uh, anything he came up with. But the word, the, the, he traveled throughout the Arab world while the Ottoman Empire was collapsing and uh, other countries were being formed. And he came up with this phrase called le printemps arabe. Uh, or the Arab Spring. Until today, French journalists refer to the events uh, of the Middle East uh, as les printemps arabes, as in the Arab Springs. So what's the deal with the Arab revolutions? What's going on? What's the background? And where are we going from here? These are things that we'll talk about in the next uh, hour or so. Um, there were several studies written about why the Arab Spring happened. There was, uh, there was a series of uh, studies co authored by a wonderful lady who um, called the Arab Human Development Report, in which um, that talked about a, a, a human rights deficit, a freedom deficit, economic growth that failed, a women's rights deficit, democracy deficit. So all these factors were there, in fact, the Arab Spring should have happened a decade ago, two decades ago, maybe, de maybe decades before 2011. There was a study that uh, found that the economies of the Arab world actually shrank over the past few decades. Even the Gulf states, there was a negative growth of 2.8%. There's, there's a word I never heard of before called de-development. So in fact, we were regressing in the last 60 years in the Arab world. And there was all sorts of reasons that, that the dictators would use, all sorts of excuses. But ultimately, it was the denial of human rights. It was the denial of the citizens' rights that, that led to, uh, to the, to the uh, Arab awakening. Two issues, though, that, that, uh, that are uh, talked about a lot, which is the role of social media. And this is something that I think I spent some, some minutes on. There was two events that, uh, that took place in 2010, before the Arab Spring, that really uh, uh, set the, the, the wheel in motion for, for the events of 2011. Uh, one is more famous than the other. There was the case of the young Tunisian uh, vegetable seller who was in a, a small town that I had never heard of called Sidi Bouzid. And uh, he was unemployed, and he had his vegetable cart that he would wheel into the square. And he, would try, he was trying to sell vegetables. So a police officer comes and uh, you know, tells him off, uh, tells him, you can't sell here. Go back. 
this is no place for you, he goes back and he sets himself alight. And uh, even in the repressive uh, regime of Bin Ali, in which uh, uh, the, the, the internet had a police officer known as Ammar 404, who would stop you from surfing any websites. Even in that repressive environment, news of this young man spread like wildfire across the, uh, across the, uh, the blogosphere and the internet, to the extent that the tightly controlled newspapers actually reported on the incident. The president, uh, former dictator, went to visit him. Um, and uh, on June 4th, that young man uh, passed away, Ahmed Bouazizi. And within six days, the dictator was ousted. Another event that also uh, played a big role is, and this is where social media comes in, is the, uh, is the killing of uh, a young Egyptian called Khalid Saeed. Well, Khalid Saeed was a 24-year-old. They were both 24, 25 years old, young kids. So Khalid Saeed was killed by two police officers. He was an IT engineer, and he saw them exchanging drugs in Egypt, in this, ta in this neighborhood called Sidi Gaber in uh, Alexandria. So he filmed them, and they saw him, they followed him, and they, 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 they dragged him out of the internet cafe. We call it internet cafe back there. And um, they beat him to a pulp. To the, uh, and then, you know, they didn't care about him. They just wanted to take the video footage. And photos of him went viral on the internet. Uh, these police officers were sentenced to four days, and that was it for beating a young man up. So what happened was young Egyptians started a Facebook page called We Are All Khalid Saeed. And it got thousands upon thousands of, uh, of, of members on that Facebook page. And in order for them to, uh, to identify each other, reach out to each other, social media was the only medium. And so what they decided to do was they decided to dress in black and go and stand on the streets of Alexandria on the Corniche, uh, carrying, some of them carrying their Bibles, some of them carrying their Korans, some of them just, you know, just, dressing, just dressed in black, standing next to each other, but leaving a few yards difference, maybe, maybe six, seven yards between them. And why did they do that? Because Egypt was and continues to be under state of emergency, which means that no more than four or five people can congregate together in a room without an official permit. So they were able to bypass this law that says that you can't be together by standing next to each other like this, and then the next person a few, meet, a few yards away like that, and in complete silence for several hours a day over a period of a few days. Uh, and, and everybody knew why they were there. Everybody knew that these young men and women were unhappy about the death of this young gentleman. Uh, the administrator of that Facebook page, you might have heard of him, his name is Hua al Ghanim, And he was the young Google executive who was detained for 11 days during the Egyptian uprising. So what happened on, on social media, these young men and women decided uh, and this was, by the way, many people don't know this, this was decided before the fall of the, Egyptian, of the Tunisian dictator. They identified the 25th of January uh, as the date where they want to go and, uh, and protest. And, and that's why it's called the January 25th revolution. But why January 25th? Because that is the day, that, that day is police day in Egypt. That day, Egyptians celebrate police day because the police were, 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 you know, gave them a lot of cause to celebrate. So, but the reason, actually the reason why they chose Jan 25 was that was the day that most police officers were off duty. And they were able to march in the streets while the police officers were on holiday. And, and the, you, the beginning of the, of the revolution, in the beginning of the uprising, people, people demanded three things. Uh, say them in Arabic, Aish, Hurriya, Adal, Iktima'iyya. Bread, freedom, and social justice. But by the 28th of January, there was a huge crackdown, and several people, many people, dozens in fact, had died in the first few days. And uh, th then they started chanting, we want the end of the regime. But let's go back a few months. What's the deal with social media? What is social media in the, uh, in the Arab world? Is it really that important? Did it really play that decisive a role? Now, the Arab world consists of about 300 million people. Um, about 75% uh, 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 are uh, under 29, so it's a very young region of the world. 
25% um, of them unemployed. Imagine that. That's about what? 40, 50 million unemployed individuals. Some countries don't consider women who are unemployed as unemployed, unfortunately. But the truth is the numbers were hovering between the 20s and 30s. So you had this young region using social media. Facebook, for instance, penetration. January 2010, you had 11.9 million users of Facebook in the Arab world. December 2010, 12 months later, you had 22 million users of social media in the of Facebook in, in, in the Arab world. Number of user, Twitter users, several tens of thousands. By the end of the revolution, five and a half to six million. Um, now, keep in mind, there are 300 million Arabs. That, so that means that it was a sort of an elite instrument. Not everybody had access to social media. Less than 10% of, the, of, the, uh, of Arabs had access to social media. But what social media allowed them to do was to reach out to each other. It allowed them to identify each other, find a common slogan, uh, find a date in which they would start to, to, uh, to protest. It allowed them to, to unify the, the slogan. It allowed them to bypass, uh, to bypass uh, you know, police checkpoints. Where I came in is this. Um, January 2010, uh, 2011, I had a lot of free time on my hands. And uh, there was, there was the, uh, the Tunisians had started you know, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to protest against their dictator. And 150,000 of them were in the street. And it was exciting. The whole world was watching what was happening in these tiny North African countries. That, that, is, that, is really, uh, that was really the, the, I, the, the, the country that I would have nominated to be the very last. Why? Because you had the United Nations had showered it with, uh, with, with, with praise, human development, you know, women empowerment, minority rights. The Jewish community had rights in Tunisia. The, 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 uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of indicators uh, perhaps pointed to the fact that Tunisia was a stable country. Mind you, it had a lot of security as well. So there was no way that this would happen in Tunisia. Uprising happened. Ben Ali, uh, Mohammed Bouazizi died, dies. January 11th, uh, Ben Ali flies to Saudi Arabia. Now the next day, I thought it was over. I was like, this is great. Wow, one dictator is gone. I mean, this is wonderful. Maybe next year or the year after, or, or, you know, or a decade later, another one will go. But, but um, then, uh, within 48 hours, Muammar Gaddafi comes out on TV and starts. He, he had an average, one of his shorter speeches, about three hours long. <laughs> so, so he, start, he starts ranting, and he had, his, you know, he had, he, he really looked upset. And, and Gaddafi was a huge supporter of, uh, of Ben Ali. The, 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 <coughs> ben Ali's palace was built by Gaddafi, his summer home. And, uh, you know, they had tight relations. So Gaddafi starts saying things like, um, remember WikiLeaks had just released these uh, the, the documents about uh, incriminating uh, Ben Ali, saying that he's very unpopular, his family controls the economy, his wife controls, uh, you know, um, is, is despised in, in, the, in the community. So Ben Ali comes out, starts saying things like, uh, lecturing, starts saying things like, don't believe what you read in, uh, what you read in clinics. And I thought, what is clinics? And he didn't know what to call WikiLeaks, so he called it clinics. <laughs> and, he, and then he starts saying, and, and don't believe what's on Bookface. I was like, what's Bookface? This is all new words. You know, I never heard of this stuff. So, 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 I, was, so I was tweeting and tweeting and tweeting, away, writing, translating what Gaddafi was saying. And it was insane. He was saying things like, you should be so lucky to have Ben Ali be your president. You should apologize to him. Ask for him to come back. And maybe he'll return, and you should be so lucky if he does. And, and it was just hilarious. I was, I was laughing and crying at the same time, tweeting about what this insane individual was saying. And this is, this is where I think where the tipping point for me was. I noticed that I had, what, 5,000, 6,000 followers? I noticed that by the end of the, the next day, I had double or triple that number. People were saying, follow this guy who's translating what Gaddafi is saying now. It's hilarious. 
And uh, yeah, so so um, so there was there was about a two two and a half hour speech in which I was tweeting every forty seconds. So you can imagine my thumbs were very very sore by the end of that end of that evening. So then you know, uh, Ben Ali uh, departs January uh, uh, twenty five. So a good, what, a good 10 days, two weeks between them, we had time to crack our knuckles and, you know, and, uh, and the Egyptian revolution started. We didn't know it was a revolution. We thought it was just a, just a protest on police day. And uh, Mubarak shuts down the internet. Mubarak shuts down uh, TV. Mubarak shuts down mobiles. Mubarak shuts down satellite channels. Al Jazeera was chased out of Nilesat. You can't call internationally. You were completely disconnected. Now, you do have countries that are not wired, like North Korea. But to have a country that had a decent amount, 10 million maybe social media users in Egypt, all of a sudden, none of them have access to information. However, there was one ISP left, internet service provider, um, basically the company that provides internet services. One was called Noornet, and that company, or Noor DSL, now that company, was uh, to, to, uh, catering to the banks and to the brokerage uh, firms and the central bank. So they were separate, then, uh, separate from the other uh, uh, firms. So that company allowed a small number of Egyptians to access the internet. So what happened was there were maybe several thousand of Egyptians who would, who would tweet from Egypt or who would call or who would, uh, who would uh, um, who were able to stay in touch with the rest of the world, only several thousand in a country of 80 million. And these were the lifeline of, of Egypt. These, these were really the brave men and women who kept Egypt in touch with the rest of the, uh, rest of the world. And so, uh, so I was tweeting things like, you know, Habib al-Adli. Habib al-Adli is who? He's the interior minister of Egypt, who, who was sentenced to 12 years on corruption uh, um, a, few, a few months back. He, he's, going, he's undergoing another trial now with Mubarak. So I was tweeting, I remember one day, uh, you know, it was constant, constant, 24 hours a day, three weeks, I didn't go to work, I didn't do anything except watch Egypt. And um, I remember tweeting about, about Habib, Habib al-Adli saying, we're withdrawing all the police forces from the streets. Why? Because the police were implicated in shooting live bu uh, bullets at protesters. I remember the most popular tweet I ever sent out was this, and I, remember, I memorized it because it went out several thousand times. In the original form, it was retweeted. And the, the tweet was, Al Jazeera, Egyptian doctors, we have been ordered not to report deaths by live bullets. Um, so this tweet w really went out all over. And they, so that meant that the police were using live bullets against Egyptian protesters who didn't have any weapons. And then, so, I, so Habib al-Adli, the next, you know, three days later, withdraws all the police from the streets. Can you imagine being in Michigan, Boston, New York, Washington, LA, and there is not a single police officer in the street, how you would feel? It's a frightening thought. You know, anybody can break into your house and you can't pick up the phone and call 911 and say, someone's breaking into my house. So you had this community police uh, started to be formed uh, in Egypt. So I remember tweeting, you know, uh, police officers withdrawn from the streets. Now they've gone out of this neighborhood. Now they've gone out of that neighborhood. Uh, reports of thugs being, uh, you know, going into that area. And, I, and, I, and I, had my, I had my TV, and I had my laptop, and I had my iPhone, and I had my headset. And I, I was completely wired, you know, talking on the phone, watching TV, tweeting, listening to the radio. Two, two, two decoders rewinding, forwarding, what was happening in Egypt in those days. I get a phone call from, from this guy I went to school with. Sultan, yes. Uh, who is it? Who is it? And I'm tweeting, I'm like, what's going on? Who is it? And I, and he's go, and I saw this number from Egypt. Who is this? It's me. So I can't say his name. It's me. I went to school with you. We call him Salem. It's me, Salem. I went to school with you. I'm like, Salem, what the hell? Who are you? What's going on? And he goes, he goes, Sultan, I'm like, oh my god, my friend is calling me from Egypt, and it, it looks like it's interesting. He, uh, you know, he was able to get a line outside, uh, outside the country. This is so exciting. I'm going to ask him about what's happening on the ground. And he starts saying things like, 
uh, and, he saw, and then he starts telling me, Sultan, you ha I have to ask you for something that's very important. My friend is telling me to ask something very important. He's going to tell me something very important. Sultan, you have to stop to eating. He told me to stop to eating. And then people, are, people like dozens of, of, of comments. No, no, don't stop. Don't stop. You can't stop. You can't stop. And then I'm like, oh my God, he's telling me to stop to eating because I'm, I'm spreading havoc and chaos in, in Cairo and in Egypt. And people are, you know, people are scared because I'm saying that there's no one in the street. There's no police in the street. And I'm like, oh my God. And so I say, so I say, uh, I say uh, uh, he's asked me to stop tweeting. And then he, and he, he, he tells me the reasons why. And I'm like, I'm going to tell him I can't. He goes, I saw your tweet. I saw that you said you were going to stop. You have to stop. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I'm, I'm going to apologize to him. You can't. You have to stop. So I completely, I mean, uh, I, I ignored him. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't. I understand. He goes, I'm standing in the mall. And I'm holding a fire hose. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to, uh, Oh, open what's fire hose? Open water at any protest, at anyone who comes into the mall because I have to protect the mall. And the, I'm he was the head of this mall or something. So so uh, I ignored him, uh, fortunately. And I'll tell you why I ignored him. And this is where the role of social media comes in. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, people, a lot of Egyptians, uh, were depending on on information from social media for their own safety. I had a lot of comments, people saying thank you. For, for tweeting that there were thugs in the street, in that corner, under that bridge, in that neighborhood, because uh, my sister was going to go out shopping, my brother was going to go to the supermarket, but, but, but I know, and I'm driving in the street, and I'm walking in the street, I have no access to TV, the radio doesn't work, the only thing I have is, the, uh, is, is, my, is my Blackberry, and I can tell that there are thugs in that neighborhood, and that's why I, am not, I, I didn't let my mom or dad or brothers or sisters go there. So, so social media, in a way, did play a role, even though it wasn't completely decisive. Now, um, what happened uh, after Egypt, well, basically the Middle East, fell apart. You had several revolutions. You had uh, Bahrain. You had uh, Syria. You had li uh, Libya. You had uh, Yemen, of course. And the governments adapted to social media. How so? In the beginning, social media was used by young folks, young boys and girls who wanted to communicate with each other. In the beginning, they were flirting with each other on social media. And then it became a tool of survival. But by the third Arab uprising, the, the social media was used as a tool against the, uh, the protesters. You had uh, government-affiliated accounts that we, we refer to uh, as trolls, people that you can't identify. We have, we have others known as, uh, we call them eggs. Why do they call them eggs? Because the default Twitter handle photo is an egg. So people who just created accounts, you know, and just to attack you, just to uh, uh, threaten you. Um, governments uh, in the Middle East jailed bloggers, jailed Twitter users. They used their Twitter accounts as, as, uh, as a proof against them, against, for instance, uh, uh, against them planning a protest, against them using uh, you know, language that the government didn't like. You have several uh, uh, social media activists who are in jail today in the, in the Arab world, and the t prison terms, believe it or not, prison terms for retweeting just taking what someone said and saying that person said this can vary between three and 10 years in jail in the Arab world. So it, it was completely, completely uh, uh, insane. On the other hand, you have, uh, you have stories where social media was, 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 a, uh, you know, was used in a good way. Four years ago, there was a young Saudi gentleman, uh, Fuad al-Farhan, and he had written a blog uh, called 10 Saudis I never want to meet. <laughs> and, and it was just that innocent. I just don't want to meet them. He didn't, you know, he didn't say I want them to be hurt. He didn't say I want them, you know, something bad to happen to them. He just said I never want to meet them. And he, one of them was a, a prince. One was a, one was a clergy. One was a mayor. And one was a judge. And uh, within, a, within a short while, he was thrown in solitary confinement between November 2007 and March 2008, for four, four to five months, he was in solitary confinement. This was over a blog post. What, fast forward four years, 
in the midst of the Arab, uh, Arab uprisings. Uh, that same gentleman, uh, as a result, was called in by a prince of uh, the prince of the western region of Saudi Arabia. You know, the same government who jailed him. They called him in and said, how do you do? Come in, tell us about your followers. Could please tell them that we're doing, we're reforming. Tell them that we're doing so and so. This is how we're trying to build infrastructure. Say hello to your Twitter users. <laughs> so this guy, I mean, imagine that. From being thrown in jail, to, to the, the power of uh, people on social media and, and in, in the Arab world shows you. Uh, there was another case where the, where the Saudi women drivers, for example, on June 17th, uh, between 60 and 90 Saudi women drove on the street and they used social media, number one, to create a Facebook page, identify each other, reach out to each other, choose a date, specific date that they would all do this. Uh, so that rather than it becoming a singular, you know, individual effort, it was a collective effort. It was, uh, and they, they, used the, they used the same slogan. And the most beautiful of all, in this case, was the fact that um, young men, men and women, would tell them, watch out, there's a policeman on this road, avoid it, turn. You know, so, they, so the, the girls would be driving and somebody would be reading for them saying there's a policeman on this junction stopping, stopping women drivers. As a result, two out of the 60 were stopped. Only two out of the 60 girls. So you can imagine that without social media, perhaps, uh, the number might have been uh, quite higher. Another, another issue that, that is quite negative about social media in the Arab world, it was used to spread uh, um, uh, uh, you know, negative propaganda. Uh, in the case of uh, Libya, for instance, there was blatant uh, racism in some of the, some of the uh, uh, social media updates. From, um, I'll give you a background on this. Uh, Libya is a country of uh, five to six million people, of which one and a half to two million are, are uh, sub-Saharan African, you know, African migrants who are working in Libya. Now, um, you know, it, when, when in, Gaddafi, in Gaddafi's era in 2000, when he was trying to build bridges with Europe, he went and he cracked down on the, on the African migrants, even though the vast majority of them were there legally, but they cracked down on them. And as a result, 150 Africans uh, died in, in Libya, uh, of which, uh, you know, ironically, 10%, 15 were Libyan citizens. Because in southern Libya, you have dark-skinned uh, Libyans. And, and uh, fast forward 10, 11 years, <coughs> In social media, from the very first date of the uh, very first day of the Libyan uprising, you had people tweeting saying, uh, "You know, African mercenaries," and 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 imagine there was a million of them. Can they all be African mercenaries? So so uh, you even had an official in, in, in Gaddafi's government, who ironically moved to the other side and continued continued using the same. Uh, you know, vile statements against, against these migrants. Um, so social media, in this case as well, had, had a, dual, uh, a dual use. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the reaction of the Gulf states, where I come from. You've had, so far you've had um, the three, three uh, Arab uh, populations were able to overthrow their leader. Uh, um, Egypt, Tunisia, and uh, Libya, I think so. I mean, he's hiding, more or less, he's overthrown. So, um, but what about the Gulf states? Now, the Gulf states are the wealthier states. You had, you had uprisings in the Gulf states. You had a, a country to the east of the Arab world called Oman. Oman, hundreds of people protested. The Sultan uh, decided to kick out the cabinet, uh, you know, give powers to the, to the, to the consultative council. And that was the end of the uh, uprising, uh, more or less. Uh, on the other side, you had Bahrain. Bahrain, you had uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands uh, of people who went out on the street. Bahrain is interesting, why? Because it's probably the most wired country in the, in the Arab world. They have 200% mobile uh, phone penetration rate. They ha it's insane. Everyone has two phones, three phones. Uh, uh, you know, uh, because you, I mean, what if someone calls you and you have another line, you, you could answer. <laughs> so, 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 um, so, so in Bahrain, imagine this. In 2010, uh, one, one, uh, uh, one blog 
used to have 100,000 hits a day in a country of half a million. That was an insane number. A very young population, very educated. Once again, a country that a lot of people didn't expect uprisings to occur because the king had given uh, uh, rights. Uh, the, uh, the, um, you know, there was a, uh, the, the minorities, the Christian, the Jews, uh, uh, the Hindus were given rights and they were, they were appointed as ambassadors, members of parliament. So very progressive country. But something happened and there was an uprising. Uh, within a month, uh, two other Gulf states sent in, sent in uh, uh, troops. Uh, the uprising uh, was put down, although the, the dialogue uh, continues. But what about the other Gulf states, the other four Gulf states? Saudi, UAE, where I come from, Qatar, and Kuwait. They're the wealthier states. Their reaction to the Arab Spring, and this is a bit of the economics of the Arab Spring, their reaction was very much financial. Saudi Arabia announced uh, in, in March 130 billion dollars aid and infrastructure projects. A massive amount of money. It's actually bigger than the, uh, than the uh, aid package of the US uh, compared to the, to the size of the economy. So huge, huge amount. Um, for instance, uh, you know, imagine this. The, the largest number of jobs created overnight, 130,000 jobs in which sector? It wasn't in arts and entertainment. It was in security. 130,000 security jobs created in the Gulf. Uh, at wh why? You have tens of thousands of young, unemployed, unhappy, uh, dissatisfied young men and women, but men uh, within, within a stroke of a pen, you got them into your security, you turn them to your side. You give them jobs, now they're on your side. Anybody thinking of protesting? You have 130,000 people who probably uh, will come in handy. Um, with, regards to, uh, with regards to Egypt, for instance, now Egypt is an interesting case. Egypt was really the, balance, the balancing state of the, of the Arab world. It had a peace treaty with Israel. They, they, uh, it had, uh, uh, you know, it had a, a regime that the, the world was in general happy with if, if it continued to reform. So there was, uh, internally people weren't happy, but in general the rest of the world were, was happy with Mubarak. Another thing about Egypt is that for the Gulf states, it was a counterbalance to Iran, where, where, where Iran is a, is a threat to the, to, the, to the Middle East and to the Gulf states. Egypt was the only country that had the sufficient, especially after Iraq was taken out of the equation, it was the only country that had the sufficient manpower in the, in the army of about a million people in the army that could balance Iran out. So for the Gulf states and for the, for the region in general, it was important to have a stable Egypt. And that's why after the, after the fall of Mubarak, the Gulf states went to, uh, went to Egypt and uh, offered so, so much. Qatar, one of the smaller Gulf states, offered $10 billion in investment to create a million and a half jobs almost between, uh, in building ports. The UAE offered $3 billion, one and a half billion for an SME fund. Saudi Arabia offered $4 billion. In other countries where, where uh, uprisings were starting, uh, like Morocco and Jordan, the, uh, you know, Saudi gave $2 billion to Jordan and invited them into the GCC club. The GCC is the, is the Gulf Monarchies club. It's the club of all the, the kings of the Gulf. So they invited Jordan and Morocco, even though Morocco, last time I checked, isn't on the Persian Gulf, Arabian Gulf. It's a bit far, but they kind of invited them in because they wanted uh, this, this, this alliance uh, of, uh, of, uh, of monarchies. But is this sustainable? Is it sustainable? Can you buy your way? Can you, pay, can you continue paying money? It's highly unlikely that you can continue paying money when people's demands are for more, for more, human, for more rights. Um, just, just checking on time. I think we're, we're pretty much... Uh, I'll leave you with one thought, though. Um, you know, there's 22 Arab countries. Um, you know, the, the, there's, uh, the, some of them are monarchies, some of them are republics, um, they're minorities, they're not all Arab, some of them are Berber, some of them are Jews, some of them are, uh, are Baha'is, they're minorities. It's, it's a mosaic, really, of, uh, of cultures. But what happened over the last eight, nine months really was Arabs stepping up, Arabs saying, we are citizens, we are no longer subjects. 
We are citizens that we demand our rights. Regardless of what happens over the next few months, the truth is 100 million Arabs are freer today than they were just eight, nine months ago. This can come, the, 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 uh, you know, you can see this at the glass half full, glass half empty, but we, it's a rocky road ahead uh, in, w in which uh, you will see a lot of ups and downs, a lot of things that you are unhappy with will happen. A lot of maybe, maybe some uh, uh, Islamic uh, political groups will come into play. Um, frankly, uh, I'd rather have them in politics than have them elsewhere. But uh, the truth is, not everything will go the way we want it to go. But the trajectory is very positive. In the long term, I believe we will only see a better Middle East uh, because of the Arab awakening. Thank you. He has kindly agreed to take questions, and we will go until no later than 5.30. Um, so if you just put your hand up, identify who you are for the rest of us. Hi, I'm Ian. Uh, do we have mics, or just to? Uh... Mm -hmm. uh, if you wouldn't mind just briefly repeating the question. I would. Against um, and you may be familiar with the article that got a lot of publicity um, in the wake of the airstream and not from Black Mountain and the New Yorker, which basically tried to dispense the, with the notion that social media causes revolutions. Um, and what struck me as what he got wrong was that social media plays a very different function in places like the United States, where there's a very strong, where there's civil society is strong, versus, say, in the Gulf states or in the Arab world, where civil society is relatively weak. And so even before the Arab Spring, you had these Facebook groups like in Saudi Arabia where women would get together and talk about the wearing of the veil and how they felt about it and whether they had posted. Um, do you think the role of social media will become less important as civil society grows stronger and if it grows stronger? Okay, the question was, do you think the role of social media will become less effective as civil society uh, grows? Definitely, yes. I think uh, uh, p uh, part of the reason why um, why, the, why, why social media is so uh, uh, prevalent in the, in the Arab world, why people de depend on it so much, is the avenues of communications, the official avenues are shut. There, there is no way to, to, to form civil society movements. Uh, the government has to appoint the head of the, of the, movement, of, of the uh, association. Uh, your agenda is very much set, for, set by the government. Uh, that's why social media really wasn't, a, isn't a huge tool here in America. Because you can just go apply and, and start your uh, civil society movement, you know, w within a few hours, I think, in the States. Um, I think this is definitely the case. Uh, perhaps with the, freer, with the freer countries, you will see less and less use of, civil, uh, of uh, uh, social media. However, there are a lot of countries that will not, uh, that will not be free in the next uh, year or two. This, the Arab awakening is a generational issue. It will take decades, if not generations. And so I think you will continue to, to, to see a, a role for, for social media. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Nathan Thompson. I'm a, a doctoral student at American University in Washington, D.C. that I'm spending this year in Ann Arbor. And my question less on social media, but more uh, media more broadly in the Arab world. And I'm particularly interested in your take over recent development for the last couple of days with um, Al Jazeera and uh, Wada Khanfar's uh, uh, timing of stepping down um, and uh, his successor, which it seems is, is, is a member of the royal family in Qatar. Um, the, uh, I think most people recognize that Al Jazeera, both Arabic and English language, has played a, an important role in what has unfolded, I think, in the past you know, eight or nine months, as you discussed. But the critique, one of the critiques is, is uh, that it's become increasingly um, uh, an instrument of Qatari foreign policy and less balanced. And uh, uh, I'd be interested in what you think is, is this is, is a pivot point for uh, Al Jazeera or you know, is his stepping down? He hasn't really uh, illustrated, the he hasn't said the reasons why, but it's mentioned WikiLeaks earlier, and there have been some cables that have come out saying that there's, you know, a, a, a relationship between some U.S. diplomats and what Al Jazeera did or did do in terms of their coverage. So, uh, I mean, I think we've all have noted that there has been a disparity in Al Jazeera as, as well as it perhaps covered 
what events unfolding in Egypt and, and recently in Libya, Bahrain was completely kind of uh, ignored to a large extent. So do you think that his stepping down is, is a signpost or would be interested in your, in your take on it? So, so just, just to put it into context, Jazeera was a channel that was started in 1996. Uh, it had 50 million viewers before the Arab uh, awakening. Now it claims between 100 to 150 million viewers. They have an English uh, uh, service as well that broadcasts in DC and New York, here in the US uh, on cable, and it's available online. Uh, for the past eight years, it was headed by a gentleman called Wadah Khanfar, who I know personally. Um, the, this gentleman stepped down uh, abruptly yesterday, uh, and a, a Qatari Sheikh was appointed uh, in his place. Um, well, the question was, will this affect the integrity of the channel and how it, was, uh, how it covered Arab, spring, uh, Arab uh, awakenings? The truth is, um, we noticed over the last... Uh, first of all, Jazeera played a huge role. Uh, uh, when, when it was kicked out of Egypt and the satellite signal was jammed, Egyptians would, would, would uh, volunteer to, to film video and send it to the channel. That's, that, that was one of the, the, the biggest examples of social media and, and, and what, what, what is termed as uh, uh, iReport or uh, on the, on the uh, amateur uh, journalism. But Al Jazeera, I mean, increasingly looks like it's an extension of the foreign policy of uh, the state of Qatar. Uh, state of Qatar is a very dynamic uh, country in the, in, the, in the Arab world. At one point in time, it hosted both an Israeli office and Hamas office you know, uh, uh, next to each other. It hosted uh, uh, people from, uh, you know, uh, from, you know, from different factions around, around the, uh, the Middle East. So it's a very dynamic uh, uh, country. However, the, the, the coverage of Al Jazeera in the last six, seven months kind of mirrored what was happening, what was the, uh, happening within the, the Qatari uh, government. Now, which one leads the other, I'm not sure. But, uh, but uh, for instance, with Libya, Qatar was the first country to recognize the Transitional National Council. Um, and Libya's coverage was very much slanted towards the, uh, the revolutionaries. Um, I mean, uh, all, uh, even, well, regardless of what our feelings uh, were on indivi as an individual basis, you have to report very, very fairly. With regards to, uh, to, to uh, uh, the Egyptian uprising, it will also mirror the, the, the ruling family's uh, um, policy or the state's policy. Yemen, same, same thing. Uh, w w relations with Israel, when they were going well, Jazeera got a lot of coverage. When they were, go when they were going back state-level-wise, uh, state the, 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 uh, the reporters weren't given permits, et cetera, et cetera. So, I don't know if, uh, if we are coupling them together or they are coupled together, but there is definitely a correlation between the channel and, and there's nothing wrong with that because you've seen other instances here with Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and the States. You also have the BBC, which, was fund, which is still funded by the British Foreign Office. Uh, so why, why can't Qatar have the same kind of uh, relationship with its media arm? Um, but, but definitely, without that channel, things would have gotten much, much more bloodier, I think. The, the revolutions would have happened sooner or later, but I think that having, a TV, having the... Um, there was a famous quote that, that Wadah Khanfar said. Um, he was getting messages from Egyptians uh, where they had cameras on Tahrir Square saying, please don't switch the cameras off, because if you do, a massacre will occur. So th this was the general mood, that you have a camera, so people can see what's happening live, and so you have to behave yourself as a dictator. Not you, but whoever the dictator is. Um, yes, sir. Stu Simon, a resident of the community. You mentioned earlier in your remarks that the region has been subject to negative economic growth for decades. Now, a lot of that's been due to petrodollars supporting things. But with the advent of democracy, I think uh, democracy requires viable economy. Do the people taking over power in the region understand what they need to do to create viable economies? And in a related way, any advice from you to other countries of the world, including the US, in terms of our foreign policy, what we need to do to sustain growth in their economy aside from petrodollars? OK, I'll, I'll ask you a question. I'll come back to you now. Uh, next question. Um, Basically, uh, 
the, the, the world has, given, has been giving uh, the, these, these countries that have witnessed the Arab uh, uprising, they've been giving them a lot of money. But uh, do you have the institutions that can uh, you know, uh, distribute the, this funding, first of all? Uh, what about corporate governance? Corporate governance was very poor in the, in the Arab world uh, before. How about afterwards? It's not clear. Libya, there's a complete breakdown in a system that didn't even exist in the first place. That just that it looked like there was a system there. Uh, Egypt still still has the you know they still have their their NGOs and their their their, their civil society movements etc. Um, so it's not really one uh, one single case. Yemen also needs a lot of help. There were there were calls for an Arab bank for uh, um, reconstruction and development. Uh, much like what was created in Europe, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. $200 billion have been pledged for the, uh, for the Arab countries, uh, including $38 billion from the, the G8 countries. Um, so money will, should be available, whatever, and whether this money materializes or not is a different story. But uh, I think what's important is the mechanism to, to distribute these funds, uh, corporate governance, they have to insist that this money is going to a specific cause rather than to fill up the pockets of corrupt uh, individuals. Um, you had the second part of your question, I can't remember. Advice to the Americans? I mean, America is mature. I don't think anyone should be giving America any advice. But, but it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's easier if we, uh, if, if, uh, if, the, if the Middle East or the rest of the world knows where America stands, so it can it can uh, uh, it can react, and it, they they can plan they can plan their future. Um, America has a lot of uh, clout, has a lot of uh, have, even has a lot of goodwill. American people have a lot of goodwill in, in the Middle East, a lot of respect. A lot of people want to move here. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, America just needs to clarify its position with regards to, to, uh, to uh, certain governments in the Arab world, with regards, for example, to the, to the Middle East uh, peace process. Um, the, the, the clearer the position is, the easier these countries can, uh, can, can deal with in America. There was call of an Obama doctrine. Is there an Obama doctrine? I'm not sure. Um, I'll come back to you after that. Yes, please. Uh, how has uh, the Arab uprising affected your, the field with which you are most familiar, finance and security. How has it affected the market? Oh, some countries are doing very well. Some countries are booming, actually. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, where I come from in Dubai, the airport is booming. It's just so crowded. The, the port. It has not affected. No, but some countries have, uh, have, have negative growth. Like, for example, in, in Bahrain, Egypt has 8 million to 10 million tourists a year. How many tourists have you heard of? who went into Egypt recently. The number is much, much less uh, than, than what the country needs, for instance. Uh, yes, there is one, one, one tourist here who went to Egypt in this room. We, uh, so, so really, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Uh, however, because it's a very young population, I think that, that the growth will, will, be, uh, will be very positive for, 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 for the region from 2012 and 2013. Maybe one more point. Uh, Egypt was growing very well during Mubarak's era. It's shocking. Egypt was growing between 5 and 6%, where America had 1% growth. So uh, it's not just economic. The, uh, the, 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 it's not just the economic uh, cause that, that led to the Arab uprisings, but it's, it's very much about dignity, uh, social justice, and human rights liberation. Um, so um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, I would like to hear your evaluation of some of the governments that are take, that are being formed now. What do you know about the governments that are being formed? And what is your opinion? What we know is that there hasn't been a revolution. In the, in, the, in the sense of a revolution in the Arab world. Those who are in power in Egypt continue to be in power in Egypt. Those who are in power in Tunisia continue to be in power. What I mean is the military. Mubarak and Bin Ali were just the faces of that military. Yes, that dictator is down, but in reality, the military was in charge. Perhaps in a, period, in a, in a year or two, or a decade or two, the military really would lose its power. Keep in mind Turkey, for instance, after, uh, after, the, after it overthrew the, the, the Sultan of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire uh, collapsed, it took decades in Turkey to have complete free and fair elections that led to uh, the, the current government uh, and, and, and uh, democracy. There was, a, there was a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's start with the, the dean. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, we have invited our live feed audience to tweet questions that they might have, and I'd like to read one of them to you. What is the connection of We Are All uh, Khalid Saeed Facebook page with the early protests, if any? Oh, the, the, um, they were the very instrumental. Uh, we Are All Khalid Saeed was a Facebook page that was started by two Egyptians. One of them, one of them was more famous than the other. Um, it, uh, we did answer, the, we did talk about this earlier, but it allowed people to, to, to identify uh, the method of protest, the time of protest, the location of protest. You cannot, otherwise you ha you'll be having to, to, you know, to write notes and passing them, passing them around the neighborhood. But, the, uh, but because of social media, people said, we're gonna wear black, we're gonna stand uh, a few yards apart, we won't talk to each other, so that no one accuses of congregating in public, and we will do this repeatedly over, over a period of a few days. So that's what the, the, the uh, and it continues to exist today, we are all Khalid Said. So the role was quite decisive. Um, just take the gentleman's question. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mahashyam, a first year MPP student here. Uh, two questions. One, uh, how come everyone missed it? I mean, you know, I, I remember reading uh, Lisa Anderson, I believe, who was the head of American University in Cairo. So she was right in the middle of it, and she confessed that she never knew about it. Uh, second, Ehud Barak, you know, he was like sort of amused, and he was very, uh, you know, numerous when he said that you know, the best secret service on earth missed it completely. That's one side of it. I mean, one question: How can we all missed it? And second, uh, what's the guarantee that these countries wouldn't slip? further into you know a regressive regressive regime what happens if a slightly ultra islamist kind of a comment comes in Okay, the question was, uh, um, how come we missed it, the Arab awakenings? And what if um, we slip into um, a regression rather than progress? Um, how come we missed it? Uh, the truth is all the signs were there. People can choose to ignore them. Um, in fact, uh, the countries that, re that received the best marks are the countries that had some of the uprisings, whether it was Egypt or Tunisia. Um, I think arrogance, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, was a major uh, factor, at least from the government's level, that they believed that they were immune. They believed that they can continue to repress their people. They believe that they can continue to hire, you know, their cousins and their relatives in, in the top positions and, and, and their little mafioso, mafioso uh, state. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, there was a straw that broke the camel's back. Why was it straw number one million and not straw number 995,000? I'm not sure. But there was really one single issue, and, and, and perhaps it was a, a collection of factors that came together. Uh, the other reason, do we, will we regress? I think in some countries we will regress. I think in some countries, uh, for example, in Tunisia, which is which is really a, a model, which was really a model state for for secularism and for women's rights. I believe that if if the Islamic Party comes to power, they might try to 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 uh, put you know to uh, put restrictions on women. In Tunisia, women inherit equally as men. Women's uh, women's testimony at uh, court is equal to men. Women can divorce their husbands. So there was a lot of women's uh, empowerment in Tunisia. This, we might see a regression in this, but I believe that it will just be a, a temporary regression. Uh, now that the Islamic part parties have to play nice, now that they have to play part, uh, they have to be part of the political process, they, you will see a lot of coalition building, and, and then there will be a lot of compromise. Uh, in the end, people will not People did not revolt against one dictator to have another dictator stay there. I think we're all conscious of this, uh, of this fact. Did you have a question? I just had a comment about the Khalid Saeed, Kulina Khalid Saeed. Uh, it was also kind of uh, a tool for expat Egyptians yes. to kind of follow what happened in Egypt, especially those who were not on Twitter. Um, but also, I was wondering if you could talk about um, Palestine and what, what's next for Palestine now that we, you know, Arabs are rising up and uh, uh, actually doing something and they're going to uh, place their bid at the UN and stuff like that. Okay, the question was, uh, what about Palestine? Um, you know, there's, there's this uh, uh, um, notorious slash infamous uh, uh, slash gutsy move by the uh, by the uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, or the, not the Pal I shouldn't say Palestinian government by the by the by the uh, by the Mahmoud Abbas government to to put in a bid to create a, a 194th state in the in the um, in the United Nations. Um, I think uh, with with regards to Palestine, um, it is you know it is a it is 
uh, it's gone on for far too long. Uh, it's been what, 63 years, I think, now uh, since some, since some people were some people became refugees. But I believe that Arabs are equally to blame for this. I believe that you know um, that 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 Palestinians are th are treated badly in Arab countries, and I believe that as an Arab, I want to take ownership of this issue. I, there are hundreds of thousands of Palestinians living in in, in ghettos in in Arab states, whether it was Egypt. Or or, 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 or or Syria or Lebanon or Jordan they are, they, you know we should we should demand that they get that they get treated better why should another generation grow up uh, in injustice and living really in conditions that you wouldn't want uh, animals to live in you know crammed up in, in, in a city that was built for five and ten thousand you have a hundred and two hundred thousand people living there so first of all Arabs must take ownership of this issue we must uh, we must admit that we have failed uh, uh, Palestinians, uh, number one. Number two, you know, um, Israel also must must be held accountable for for this issue. Now, um, I don't know how it's going to happen, but these two sides must sit together. Um, ultimately, we d I don't think anybody wants this to con to continue. Uh, we've seen demands by by people in the street. Um, you know, we've seen pressure coming from different governments. The truth is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a card. That, that various governments are playing against each other. I don't know the details. Uh, I don't tweet about Palestine-Israeli uh, conflict, conflict because it's a minefield that I cannot put my mind around. But all I know is, uh, you know, I worked with I worked with, uh, with with Jewish people in university. I worked with Arabs. I worked with Christians. I worked with Muslims. They can work well anywhere in the world except in, in that region. And, and so and so, th there must be something with the water. There must be something there. I don't know what it is, but, but someone should check it. So ho hopefully, hopefully things, I mean, I remember writing an article saying that, that the, 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 what, what Osama bin Laden was calling for was, you know, was a specific a, a sect, a specific, you know, uh, people who follow a specific strand of Islam were better than anybody else. And the truth is no one is better than anybody else. No, no, no Muslim, no Christian, no Jew, no Hindu, no, no atheist is better than anybody else. And uh, once we admit to this fact, once we can see through people, rather than looking at their religion, labeling them with, 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 with their religion, I think we're, gonna, we're going to bypass this issue. But I believe this, this conflict should not, should not last any longer. Uh, a lot of people disagree with what the, what the Habas government is doing, but there needs to be a jolt. Someone needs to come and jolt uh, uh, the, the, the process, and maybe this, is the, maybe this is a jolt, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, it, it, will, it will create positive uh, uh, repercussions. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. My name is John Wilhelm, and I have a two-part question. What impact did the previous demonstrations in Iran have, and what impact is the, particularly the success of the Arab Spring likely to have on Iran in the future? A good question. What impact did the Iranian uprising of 2009 have on the Arab Spring, and and, and, and how will how will it affect the future? Uh, first of all, the Iranians uh, um, apparently uh, uh, tried to elect someone other than Ahmadinejad, but then um, Ahmadinejad was chosen for them to be their president. Um, so so that was they, they didn't like that much. So hundreds and thousands of them went out on the streets demanding uh, you know uh, their rights, but they were brutally suppressed. Um, we know several things. We know that the Iranian government shared with the Syrian government uh, methods on identifying people on social media. Remember how social media was used as a tool of the counter-revolution? Much of it is thanks to uh, our friend in, in Tehran. Um, the, the second thing, uh, the second aspect is, uh, you know, um, um, Iran uh, today uh, is worried about losing its ally in Syria, and and it's trying its very best and uh, to to keep him there. And in fact, whenever you have the supreme leader or the president talk about Arab uprisings, he would say things like in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Egypt, in Tunisia. He would name every country on on the face of the earth except Syria. Why? Because that's his that's his best buddy. In fact, Iran is the only friend left. Uh, uh, to, to, uh, to Bashar al-Assad in, in Syria. Um, 
I, I don't know how this will affect. All I know is the, the Supreme Leader is old. Um, they, they have elections in two years' time. And Ahmadinejad cannot run for these elections. Um, the Gulf states are very concerned about the Iranian uh, nuclear program. Uh, the, the Iran claims that it is uh, peaceful. My worry is, OK, I believe you, it's peaceful. But it doesn't, it doesn't have international uh, uh, you know, observers checking. And what if Chernobyl happens? And we just live a few hundred kilometers from them. That is if you believe it is peaceful. So in the best case scenario, you're extremely worried, let alone the worst case scenario. Yes, ma'am. Um, Anne Kutcher, I'm in political science and African studies here. And most of my work is on Africa. So I'm very interested in the way in which the Egyptian protests um, took place because there are a lot of similarities rippling down the continent, even in countries that are, we would, might consider them already limited democracies at least. So, so a lot of countries are watching what happens in the Middle East, but uh, farther south. And one thing I noticed from the coverage is that the middle class in Egypt seems to be, I mean, the, the military in, middle, in, in Egypt seems to be quite middle class. They are, they're in some middle class neighborhoods. Some of the gated communities seem to be dominated by the military. And what I was wondering is, does that predispose them to some of the arguments made by the protesters? Is, does that make the military, therefore, more sympathetic to some of the arguments of the protesters? Or alternatively, does it make them very concerned that since some of those protesters are young and unemployed, that um, a social movement could go in a direction that is decidedly anti-property and anti-middle class? I think that the, the military should be concerned, very concerned. Um, the fact is they control 30% of the Egyptian economy. Um, the, the military, uh, the, what my worry is that they were always in the background. However, today, the head of the Egyptian military is receiving world leaders, he's getting cables sent to him, he's being treated like the president. Now that he has had a taste of the, of the good life, is he going to give up this, uh, this power? Chances are he's going to fight for it. Um, even though he is older. We don't know the succession even within the military. It's highly secretive. People, people did not uh, hear from the military uh, during the Mubarak era. Um, yes, a lot of them will live in gated communities. Uh, Egypt has huge uh, unemployment issues. A million people enter the, uh, enter, uh, uh, the job uh, uh, market every year. There aren't enough jobs for them. Uh, the military isn't capable of creating jobs. How do you create jobs? Egyptians are asking for nationalization. Is that a good idea? Perhaps in some sectors. Uh, you need the private sector also, entrepreneurship. Uh, a lot of these people, you know, the UN Human Development Report, Report says that by 2020, 100 million jobs should be created in the Arab world to keep the miserable unemployment levels that we have today. Just to keep them, as we are 25% unemployment, you have to have 100 million jobs by 2020. The military in Egypt won't be able to create jobs. They have to. Uh, let civil society uh, uh, create jobs the best way they see fit. Is there any other question? Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't see. Yes, would you? Why don't we make this the last question? Last question, okay. I have a question about the countries that have been about the Gulf states that do not have revolution. Uh -huh. Those are relatively stable, the economy is good, they're growing like crazy, like in Dubai. Could we expect to see anything from them? We didn't expect Tunisia to happen as a secular country, but the country as well, there's no human rights in the region. But could we expect to see that in Qatar, Dubai, Saudi Arabia? Okay, the question was, would, do you expect any uprising in the wealthier Gulf states where we didn't hear much, uh, uh, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, UAE, and uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, the, the answer is, uh, Every country in the Gulf is experiencing the, Ar experiencing the Arab awakening, uh, in the Arab world, is experiencing the Arab awakening in a different way. In some, in some areas, you want a complete overhaul of the system. In some states, uh, like Libya, for instance, in other states where you have the military staying, but then you have civil society trying to advance the agenda. In other states, like Morocco and uh, uh, Jordan and Oman, the monarchs try to introduce reforms very quickly. In Bahrain, you had the government uh, uh, suppress the, 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 the uprising. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, you had one man show up for the day of rage. 
Uh, unfortunately, he's, he's detained. It's a story is quite, quite sad. Uh, uh, every time I think about it, it makes me very upset. Uh, um, so, uh, for instance, in the UAE and Qatar, um, the, the, the local populations only make up 10% of the entire population. Um, so, I mean, in general, living conditions are quite satisfied. Yes, you cannot dismiss and say, well, uh, uh, you know, just because everyone's happy doesn't mean that, that um, you know, that there, there, there isn't some kind of political movement. Um, the UAE has elections uh, for, for a, a non-legislative uh, for, for a, a non, um, parliament coming up in the next couple of days. Uh, will this satisfy people? Some individuals wrote, wrote petitions in the Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, in Qatar, uh, in Kuwait. People have, people have been moving. Um, like I told you, chances are this, some, some, some regimes will take longer to adapt. My personal opinion is, and I am on the record here, my personal opinion is the only way forward for all the monarchies in the Arab world, if they want to stay monarchies, would be uh, to create constitutional monarchies where, 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 where there's much more uh, uh, people empowerment rather than uh, the, the, the absolute rule model that we have, to, we have today. Well, before we thank our speaker, I did want to make sure that you know that you're all invited to join us at the reception just outside of the Great Hall, and we can continue the conversation more informally. Um, but I would like to give a very special thank you for those insightful, informative, wide-ranging, candid remarks. We are very honored to have you here with us today for the Josh Rosenthal Lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much.